This video is sponsored by The Sight Reading Factory. Use my code to get 10% off your first year. Strategies for Sight Reading, Part 3. So far in this series, we've covered a number of tips and ideas that mostly skew towards basics and fundamentals, which are not to be underestimated. This next set of tips are what I would consider to be more intermediate. Let's start with a couple of quick ones. The first is to subdivide your rhythms and counting. Previously, we talked about how your inner monologue should always be counting along with the beat, so you know how to manage rhythms and rests. If you don't, you're going to get lost a lot and make errors on pretty simple music. But even if you are counting and you know exactly when to come in, it can still be difficult to execute certain rhythms correctly. Subdivision can be key in preparing yourself to execute upcoming rhythms. Let's say you're counting a rest and there's a bar coming up with eighth notes. If you can just get started, you'll probably be okay. So instead of just counting the beat and then you're in and good luck, you might count eighth notes in the rest. One and two and three and four and. And this works equally well for other subdivisions. For 16th, you could count the whole bar ahead in 16th, or maybe just the last beat or two. One, two, three e and a, four e and a. And the same thing with triplets. One, two, three and a, four and a. Pickup beats can be especially confusing for some people, but subdividing can really increase your confidence about when to come in like coming in on an eighth note pickup. One and two and three and four. Or multiple eighth notes. One and two and three. Coming in on the fourth sixteenth of beat three might be pretty intimidating for some people, but it's a lot easier if you know how to subdivide into sixteenths. One E and a two E and a three E and. Subdivision can be incredibly useful for mentally preparing to play a rhythm, and it's a great habit to look ahead during rests and figure out what subdivision you should be thinking and counting. Use the custom feature of the Sight Reading Factory to focus on specific rhythms and subdivisions. And you can even turn on the metronome with subdivisions if you like. You should always be counting when you're playing music, but subdividing really brings this to the next level, and it can be a huge upgrade to your sight reading abilities. Next up is learn your scales. There are a lot of benefits to learning your scales. I did a whole video about how learning major scales gives you superpowers, and sight reading is definitely among them. First, if you're playing a piece in the key of C major, that means that the white keys, the natural notes, are likely to be used probably quite a lot, and the black keys, the sharps and flats, are probably going to be used pretty rarely, if at all. This is really useful knowledge, because your brain and fingers learn that they should only be playing these notes, and only even need to think about the others if a sharp or flat shows up in the music. And of course, if the piece is in a different key, you're just dealing with a different combination of notes, where some are really likely to show up and others not so much. The other thing that you'll begin to notice is that a lot of music is just scales and parts of scales anyway. The better you know your scales, the more often you'll see patterns and make connections. You won't have to read and play individual notes, you'll just play the scale that you already know. There are lots of different kinds of scales, but start with major scales. Learning them all can seem like a big project, but start with the easier ones and then build from there. It really doesn't even take that long if you have a halfway decent practice routine. You can use the Sight Reading Factory to focus on reading in one key or a few, or challenge yourself with full random and see if you can find any holes in your abilities that you need to patch. The payoffs to learning your scales, especially major scales, are really huge, and I promise you won't regret learning them. Next, this is a big one, and it could really transform you as a musician, and that is, use your pencil. Learning a new piece of sheet music always begins with sight reading, but that's usually only one step along the way to learning and performing a piece. You might even learn the piece well enough that the sheet music is mostly just a reminder of what to play. But before that point, you're probably still in the reading phase. Now, whether you're a new musician who will have many practices before a concert, or a more advanced musician who might only have a short amount of time to prepare music, if you have at least one practice session before a performance, you have a huge opportunity to find the traps in a piece and prepare your music with pencil markings to help avoid those traps during the performance. A good musician will not squander this opportunity. A good musician does not underestimate the power of the pencil. My general guideline is, if you make a mistake, consider writing something in so you don't make the same mistake again. If you do make the same mistake again, definitely write something in. And if you're making a million mistakes, ask yourself if you're just going too quickly, or if this piece is just too difficult for you right now. The first thing to consider is note accuracy. Did you miss the key signature? Or how about a key signature change? Circle it. Maybe write the name of the key beside it. Did you miss any notes affected by the key signature? Mark them in. 
Did you miss an accidental that lasts for the whole bar? Did you remember that it cancels at the bar line? If you see an unfamiliar note, or even if you have trouble reading it because of a bad scan or photocopy, darken it and maybe mark the letter name in. These are all easy fixes. Don't hope you'll get it right the next time. Make sure of it. Mark it in. You might write in the counting of a tricky rhythm. Or with syncopated rhythms, I often find it's enough just to stroke in where the beats are. I'll even do the same thing on cymbal rhythms sometimes. If I somehow miscount a half note or a whole note, I definitely don't want to do that again. Mark it in. Did you miss a rest? Circle it. Sometimes we call playing an arrest stepping in the hole. Don't step in the hole. Did you zone out or get confused during a long rest? Write in the word count to help you remember to pay attention next time. Seriously, it works. You might even write cues for yourself during long rests to make sure that you're always confident about where you are in the piece. Don't let simple things beat you. Let the pencil save you. You can also use the pencil to help remind you about all kinds of other markings and make them more obvious, like dynamics or articulations. If you have a repeated section, it can get really confusing, so I'll often write numbers above the bars to make it easier to follow. I'll just memorize one bar and then play it however many times are indicated. And I don't know if this is a thing that's just local to Toronto, but I know lots of people like to draw little eyeglasses on sections that are tricky or surprising or just need a bit of extra attention. And if there are jumps around the page for codas and signs, you might want to add markings so that you don't get lost, not to mention quick page turns. And there are probably a million other things that might be specific to your instrument. I definitely have my own as a trumpet player. Your teacher will probably have some suggestions about this, and you'll surely figure some for yourself out along the way. The main idea of this tip is to make sure that easily solvable problems get solved ASAP. Don't just hope to avoid these silly little mistakes the next time. Make sure of it. And one note on etiquette, if you're using original sheet music, always use a pencil rather than a pen. Not only might things change or you might make a mistake, but the owner of the music might not appreciate permanent marks on their music. Next up is don't get lost and know how to recover if you do. Sight reading takes a lot of concentration. You have to be mentally focused, present, and purposeful. But the amount of information and the speed it comes at you can be really overwhelming, and it can be easy to get lost in the music. So don't get lost is easier said than done, but there are tactics. The first thing to consider is if you're playing alone or with other musicians, because they're pretty different situations. If you're on your own, you don't need to worry about syncing up with anyone else. So just go at whatever speed you can handle and read note by note, moment by moment. If you have to slow down, it really doesn't matter. Just read each note and play it. Notice that smaller subdivisions are grouped together, which makes it easier to visually keep your place. And even if you're looking at a section that's really dense with notes, notice that the groupings can help you keep your place while you focus on playing one note at a time. If you're playing music where you have to coordinate two things at once, like two hands on a piano, imagine a vertical line scanning along the music. That line shows exactly what happens next, moment by moment. It may take a while to get up to speed and have a sense of flow, but so what? You're just reading. Pause when you have to and continue when you're ready. If you do get lost, don't go all the way back to the beginning of the piece. Just find the last spot where you weren't lost and proceed more carefully this time. It's much more important to figure out how to get through the difficult part than it is to play those easy bars again. If you're playing with an ensemble, it's a bit different because if you stop, the band will continue without you. But fortunately, your fellow musicians might be able to help you if you do get lost. The simplest solution is just to lean over and discreetly ask, Psst, where are we? Hopefully they'll be able to tell you. And you can always look up at your conductor with pleading eyes and they'll likely understand that you're lost and might be able to yell or mouth a bar number at you. And remember that music is often in big sections where changes in form or melody are fairly obvious. You might be able to hear or feel the end of a phrase coming up and watch out for big obvious changes in style, like from long and lyrical notes to short and staccato to rest punctuated with shot notes. If you're listening to the ensemble around you, it should be pretty obvious when those changes happen, and those are usually good moments to jump back in. And actually, listening is so important that it really deserves its own tip. Listen, and it works in a few different ways. For one, listen to see if your part shows up in other parts before you have to play it. If you see this section and you think it's a pretty tough rhythm, but the band starts playing before you, and you hear someone else playing something that seems like that might be it, that's a freebie, because they just showed you how your part goes. Maybe you can return the favor for them on another phrase. And always listen to see if your part fits with what everyone else is playing, either in your section or the whole ensemble. If it doesn't seem to fit, you might be in the wrong spot or have something mixed up. Stop and listen and try to figure out where you are and where you're actually supposed to be, and then jump back in as soon as you're ready. And aside from listening in rehearsal, listen to lots of music, just in general, as much as possible, especially related to the kinds of music you want to play. 
If you're presented with music for a piece that you've already listened to, the reading is usually a lot easier because you already know what the piece is supposed to sound like. And there are some things that might look a little bit weird on the page, but if you've heard them before, you're more likely to recognize them when you do. So, fill your ears as much as possible. Passive listening is almost as good as active listening, so try to get in the habit of putting on music as much as you can. The last tip is, practice staying in performance mode. When you're playing music, you can either be in practice mode or performance mode, and I think it's important to be aware of which mode you're in and what to do about it. When you're in practice mode, you're allowed to start, stop, pause, review, and retry. And that's all fine, because you're just practicing. You're just trying to learn the piece and figure out how it goes. But performance mode is different, because the goal is to avoid pauses and hesitations and to get through the piece start to finish in one unbroken attempt. Even if you make a mistake, you have to keep going with as little interruption as possible. Because nothing saps the energy from a performance more than stopping and going back and trying a tricky section a few times. This doesn't come naturally to most people. Most people have to practice staying in performance mode. When you're sight reading alone, you may start out in performance mode, but quickly fall out of it because you just can't resist fixing that little mistakes you just made. Try sight reading with a friend or your teacher. If either of you make any mistakes, they probably won't be the same ones at the same time, and the other person will just move on without you. You have to learn to recover quickly and keep up. Now, I usually call this performance mode, but on the sight reading factory, they actually call it challenge mode, and it's a great feature. This means you'll have a certain amount of time to study the piece and then it counts in and just starts playing and you have to keep up because playback is not going to stop for you. It's just like sight reading in the real world with a band. You can even turn on a feature that makes bars disappear after they've played. With this feature on, you really have no choice but to move on. It's a really great way to practice staying in performance mode. And those are all the tips for part three. They're a bit more challenging than the basics we've covered so far. But if you start putting these into practice, you're going to see a huge increase in your sight reading abilities. There's one more installment planned in this series that's coming up in a few weeks. And in the meantime, I want to give a huge shout out to the Sight Reading Factory for their support of this series. It really is a fantastic product that I use and wholeheartedly recommend. You can create new exercises to practice sight reading instantly and infinitely with all kinds of ways to customize the exercises to make them more or less challenging or to focus on specific parts of your playing. Be sure to use my code to save 10% off your first year. In the meantime, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe, and make sure to enable notifications so you don't miss the next video. Thanks for watching.